and welcome to today's webinar. This is for the Roadmap and Capabilities SDL Trillion Docs 14. My name's Kate and I'll be your host today. Today's speakers are Joe Pearman and Chip Gettinger, both from SDL. And we expect today's webinar to last around 45 minutes, followed by a Q&A session. If you have got any questions, please put them in the Q&A box, which is Q&A box, box, which is Q&A box, box, which box, which is Q&A box. Thanks very much, Kate. Um, so thank you, everybody, for joining. And let's have a quick look at the agenda here. Um, so one of the main things, of course, in, is letting everybody know that the highlights of the Trillion Docs 14 release, which is due out by mid-July. Um, so we'll spend quite a bit of time going into that, um, various different features, and particularly on uh, draft space. Um, which is a, an SME authoring environment, a new one. Um, and we'll also have a look at some stuff that's coming up as well in relation to that, kind of further developing these themes in subsequent service patches. And of course, as Kate mentioned, a good chance of Q&A at the end. We'll move fairly swiftly. It's not going to be incredibly in-depth. Um, and there's a fair bit of detail on the slides, which will be made available afterwards. Um, and if you do want to get some more kind of technical meat around it, um, then do f refer to the docs themselves. Um, feel free to refer to CHIP's team um, or to customer support to get some more information. So now, of course, the Tridian Docs 14 release wraps up uh, all of the previous service patches uh, from last year. And I just wanted to quickly go through the highlights of those. So we had the massive publishing performance improvements, for example, of Tridian Docs 13 SP1, which was out last spring. Um, really speeding up the whole publishing thing. Um, you also get the DITA 1.3 support. And with that, it's also the support for a completely standard uh, way of organizing the schemas. So if you've got any kind of normal DITA Open Toolkit customization plugin, you can basically drop it in, and that just works. Um, so that's an improvement we made last year as well. But a few kind of smaller things, unified property screens for better usability and also um, uh, easier maintenance behind the scenes, um, the inline conref previews uh, in more different situations, and the background task API as well uh, for better remote control of uh, things like publishing queues and so on. So that's all wrapped up in this release, of course. But let's go forward to look at some of the new, the new features. So this is what I'm broadly calling improvements for power users. Um, now, power users here is everybody from regular technical authors in publication manager to IT admin. And in a way, I'm contrasting power users with um, the audiences that, sorry, the user profiles that Chip will be talking about later, the SMEs. Um, but broadly speaking, so our, our core users and Trillion Docs here. Let's start by talking about content importer. Um, now, this is a desktop tool, and you may or may not be familiar with it, depending on uh, whether you've had occasion to use it before. Um, so previously, um, this is for bulk imports of standard data files, basically. Um, and you would typically use it either when migrating to Trillion Docs from some other CMS, or just from the file system, or you would use it for kind of repeated batch imports. Um, let's say you have some external content that forms part of your own content that gets updated on a regular basis, and you need to import it back in. So those use cases are still very much valid in content importer, and we've made some uh, good improvements to the tool, which I'll talk about in a second. But the other big change is that this becomes the tool uh, for importing translated files. So this is not where you have a, an integration with uh, SEL World Server or TMS. Um, this is where you work in the translations on the file system, um, and this becomes the, the way to do that. Now, as most people will know, the previous way to do that was you had to have access to a directory on the server. You had to paste your files in there and import them through the web client. And um, it's not great to be pasting things to a directory on a, on a server like that. Um, first of all, it doesn't give you enough control. And secondly, you know, it's questions about opening up directories and so on. So now this is all controlled by this nice desktop tool. So those are the two use cases. So basically, bulk imports of source language content and translated files. So let's have a look at the improvements here. So as I said, more import possibilities, and it also includes other file types, like binary files, PDFs, docx, and so on. Much, much better UX. Um, you also kind of a wizard experience, depending on the use case that you have for importing content. 
It's a nice progress bar with pause and resume. Um, you can work with previous imports and just pick them up again without interruption. Um, and also, we made a lot of uh, improvements in terms of import performance, and that was actually last year. Um, so that was in Triginops 13 SP2. Uh, but of course, we'll keep those performance improvements here. So up to kind of four times faster for importing content. Uh, and finally, you can operate it on the command line as well, so it can be automated. So just a quick preview of some of the um, UX enhancements there. So on the left, we have the old version of what you were faced with when you started to use this. Functional, but not terribly inspiring. On the right, we have the new version, so very much wizard-oriented. So clicking on one of these tiles to ident identify what you want to do. Um, and then it takes you through a nice, smooth uh, wizard from that point on. So much easier to use, much more powerful. Kind of re redesigned from the ground up, I would say. OK, um, but for a tool that I think everybody uses, Publication Manager, uh, we've also made a couple of improvements. And the first one is that a lot of people were um, asking if they could see the publishing log, so the Ditter Open Toolkit log, directly in Publication Manager rather than having to the web, go to the web client um, and kind of click through to find it. And that's what we've made available here. So you can download the Ditter Open Toolkit log directly from Publication Manager here without having to switch the web client. Another thing um, which many people were asking was the ability to actually search for different publications within Publication Manager, which of course makes total sense. Again, this was something that was just available in the web clients previously, um, and now we brought it into Publication Manager. So you can search for publications by title, um, but also any metadata, uh, which would include taxonomy linked fields that you've applied. So if you've got an integrated taxonomy, and then you can search for, for fields that's been um, applied to publication, things that they've been tagged with, basically. So that's available in, in the search in Publication Manager. On the kind of admin side, uh, just quite high level here. A lot of it gets quite detailed. Again, you know, um, follow up with um, support and other people if you want to get more details. Uh, but platform support, so obviously latest versions of language tech, world server and TMS, uh, SQL Server 2017, Windows Server 2019, um, and then particular improvements to our ish deploy, um, so for automated installs and upgrades, um, which clearly is, is the way to go, you know, to save you having to manually do things across all of your different uh, uh, content manager servers and different servers. Um, so first of all, we've got one version of this deploy now uh, for all of the recent Tridium Docs releases. And when, when I say Tridium Docs, it actually covers back to Knowledge Center 2016 there. Um, so just one consistent version, so you don't have to worry about that. And various improvements to it. I mean, it's been we're constantly enhancing this. But one particular thing here is um, uh, that you can choose to um, basically install your customer-specific files um, at a later date. So you can do your base kind of vanilla installation, if you like, of Tridian Docs, first of all. Um, and let, let's say you're going through user acceptance testing on an upgrade or something like that. Um, then you can progressively update the customer-specific files um, and tweak them as you go along without having to do a full reinstall. So some back-end enhancements as well. So those are some of the highlights of, uh, of what's coming up. But I think one of the biggest things here um, is, is really identifying new use cases and spreading Tridian Docs uh, to, to new users. And this is something now that Chip Gettinger is going to talk about. Thank you, Joe. And um, good day, everybody. It's nice to be back on the webinar and talking about the new Tridian Docs 14 release with Joe. And, and Joe, as you indicated, uh, really subject matter experts are becoming more front and center in many organizations that we're working with, and especially across industries. And uh, for many of you as customers, uh, partners that we've talked with, we've really seen trends that there's a rise of subject matters, uh, SMEs, as, as authors. And product companies, as can be developers, engineers, or perhaps product managers and marketing, you know, folks that would want to contribute content. 
in regulated organizations um, where content perhaps is the product itself. We could see research scientists, regulatory experts, uh, financial auditors, you know, experts that aren't necessarily trained perhaps in, in uh, technical writing and structured authoring, but really need to start contributing content. And in and, and many places, we're seeing SMEs becoming more the primary writers within the organization. So, of course, we have no time or budget to train. Uh, these, uh, these teams on uh, the technical professional tools that many of us used over the years uh, to do structured authoring and, and reviews and so forth. And, and to that point, you know, traditional documentation, many of you on this call are professionals. You've spent your careers understanding and learning tools, and, and they're quite, quite good at it. You, many of you are quite good at it. And the tools themselves have many features. Um, but we all know that it requires uh, training and expertise and perhaps full-time usage of these tools. And, and of course, SDL has strong partnerships with uh, the variety of tools that we support, the authoring tools, and those continue on. And for many years, they're very important for us to do that. But, but really, we start getting into now thinking about how can we work closer with these SMEs. And, uh, I actually talked about this at uh, the recent Data North America conference and had a full room of people got really excited about this. And, and kind of a summary we think about is SMEs really have a critical source of knowledge within our organization. These are our go-to experts uh, in software companies, uh, you know, regulated organizations. These are folks that really are helping decision makers. Um, unfortunately, today, many of them are stuck in working in wikis or online documents as whole documents, not as components as many of us love with uh, Tritty and Docs. You know, they've had some tech improvements. Um, you know, Google, Office 365, uh, there's tools out there, but they're, they're frequently disconnected. They're more silos and laborious and tedious sometimes to work in. And, and quite honestly, as, as, as Joe and I talk about this, we really seeing a blurring of roles. Whereas as they rise in the organization as being primary writers, how do we best engage with them as, as professional technical writers? And really, what SDL is announcing with the Treaty and Docs 14 is empowering subject matter experts really to enable easy structured authoring and reviewing, um, as well as creating suggested content and commenting, which Joe will talk about in a bit. And of course, this really takes advantage of the rich Treaty and Docs repository that many of us have invested in over the years and collaboration in real time with these subject matter experts and professional writers and so forth. So it's not unlike what we went through many decades ago of centralized uh, computers and uh, centralized uh, punch cards and so forth moving into this kind of distributed kind of environment that we see in many industries today. And so this technology democratization is now reaching across to the subject matter experts that we work with, typically around authoring. So uh, SDL is very excited and proud to announce what we call Treaty and Docs Draft Space. It's a brand new platform that fully integrates in with starting with Treaty and Docs 14 to really provide powerful but easy authoring uh, platform for uh, these SMEs. Probably one of the best benefits is it provides a whole document view. Um, again, many of us are used to working in topics, and uh, this Trinity and Docs draft space provides an entire publication that you can scroll down and work with, and, and we'll talk about this. Also of really excitement is, is a polished user experience. Um, we've intuitively grouped features and uh, show when needed. You know, if I'm working in a task topic only showed me those aspects and so forth. So very much a very polished user experience, which is really important. We've also learned from many of you is configurability is required. Uh, we don't expect every industry or across various industries to have the same uh, requirements. Of course, we're basing this off the DITA 1.3 standard, which many of you use, or perhaps earlier versions. And we've learned that we need to make this configurable. If you're a software company, you may have certain tags and other elements that you may want to hide or show uh, versus, let's say, an accounting organization. And finally, we've designed this to have future extensibility. So uh, terminology, 
uh, and integration with tools like Acrolinks or third-party tools like MathML. These are extensions that will be included in, in a future release, and Joe will talk about that in a bit. But these are very much core to the product that we know many of you things, the tools that you may be needing. And the most exciting area to me is future integration with SDL, uh, artificial intelligence, AI technology. Uh, we've heard from many of you that uh, you would like to see some automatic tagging and automatic suggestions for reuse. And so that will be coming in the future in some extensions. So really, DraftSpace is designed to really manage content and integrate directly with the Treaty and Docs repository. We've also designed this to work with very large publications. Um, many of you have publications that uh, we've really designed to scale. So we've worked very carefully on a new capability called lazy loading, which really does take advantage of web browser technology. And it's in use today in other technologies, but as a user scrolls down, <coughs> the content will start previewing. So I won't get into tech details here. But the benefits then is that you could open up a very large publication and scroll down and have reasonable performance and scalability and working with that content. Um, we also, of course, have the ability to support data configurations and also, of course, the support for reusing content, the content references and other types of uh, topic level reuse, as well as support for um, characters that are double byte with IME support and so forth. <clears throat> and we're running this inside of standard web browsers, which are supported. Um, we have some other more deeper capabilities, which are covered in a demo and link that I'll show in a bit. But you can also change the UI style, uh, the ability to do deep linking. So if I want to email uh, to Joe, for example, certain topics to work on, ability to have a URL that I could email him, and it would take him and scroll him right to that exact point and so forth. And then finally, with SDL being a global company, you'll be able to change this to a selected uh, languages uh, that the customers, your users, will be working in SME and so forth. So if we start to look at some of the capabilities we built into this, it's a very clean user interface. You can see here, for example, on the right-hand side is my outline view, which, of course, is the data map as we know it. And on the left-hand side is the actual, uh, you can see just two topics here, but as I scroll down, I would see multiple topics. There's also, you can see that I've unlocked or I'm editing a certain topic, the industry trends and challenges, but that unlock icon. And so that's very much in, intuitive within the design of the user interface. So what we've really designed this to work then is concurrent uh, with working with publications. So what that means is, is multiple users can have the same publication open at the same time, even in Publication Manager, our traditional tools can be in use. Of course, only one author can be editing a topic at a time, which of course has been part of the system from the beginning. We also have the ability to uh, insert new topics. Uh, topics. And I think one importantly is interact directly with the metadata. Uh, Joe had mentioned that we integrated the metadata fields together, so these are unified. Uh, between our traditional client tools and then the uh, disappearing in the web. But it's got a much cleaner UI design and the ability to hide certain fields and, and so forth is much easier and more intuitive. We've also listened to customers is that you need to have the ability to upload images. So uh, if you have SMEs, we'll have the ability to upload content, I'm sorry, uh, pictures and images from their repository and make references within uh, draft space. The other important thing, and I think this is where SDL really thought about uh, user interface, is, is if you have the privilege, an SME will be able to create new versions of a topic or even a map. And of course, that could be uh, depending on what user group I'm a member of and so forth. Uh, and then we can also do things like uh, hide the dialogue for properties and just create that. Or you could show that if you want to have them make changes for who assigned for the reviewer and so forth. But the other thing that we've really done is developed a, kind of a wizard approach for creating uh, the new topics and so forth. And then finally, of course, this all synchronizes very well back with the Treaty and Docs repository. So we have the ability to save or save the entire publication. 
and we've avoided using terminology like check-in and check-out and using more user-friendly terms. But behind the scenes, we're doing the very powerful capabilities of revision and version management and check-in and so forth. So it's really an exciting uh, growth for SDL to have this brand new platform around draft space, and there's a full demo available. Uh, this is a new additional feature for purchase with Tritium and Docs 14, which we could talk about at the end a bit. But there's a full demo at the community page here. Uh, and then finally, and then finally, vision, uh, professional authors, technical writers who are working today with Tritium and Docs, uh, interacting with subject matter as authors. And so it's kind of what I talked about with Draft Space. And that uh, collaboration is very powerful capability to do that on a single source repository. Joe's going to talk about what we're going to be doing at the end of the year to add in review capabilities called uh, review space. And that will be the next component that will actually add in the ability to do commenting, track changes, and suggested content, uh, interacting, of course, with the subject matter experts and then also with professional authors who are creating and managing your publications and so forth. So to that point, Joe, let me hand it back to you, and I'll be back for Q&A and any other additional points. Thanks. Thanks, Chip. Sounds great. Um, now I'm just going to break convention a little because I was scrolling through the questions from the audience, and I saw a good one, so I, I just want to pick it up just now. Um, so the question was, uh, can we turn the whole publication view off in draft space because the questioner has thousands of topics? Um, so a couple of things to that. The whole paradigm is based around empowering SMEs so they do that, get this kind of control over whole publications. Not um, exactly the same as you get in Publication Manager because that goes very deep, but still at least more control that you're working with the whole publication. Certainly the design paradigm, but we're aware that some people have absolutely huge publications. And we have this particular test one, and I wish I could remember the exact number. It's at least 10,000 topics, or it might be might be more than that. Um, and we basically tried to break this, um, and we've made it so you cannot break it no matter how many topics you get in there. And it's not just in terms of technical things like, you know, it won't crash. Um, it's all to do with the UX of it and the way that you can scroll through those different submaps. Um, the way you scroll through the topics themselves and everything is designed to work with very, very large publications if that's what you're working with. So I would suggest, you know, getting your hands on it, trying it out in a sandbox or something like that and, and seeing what you think. Um, yeah. So, but yeah, back on the threads. Um, thank you, Chip, for leading into the review space because this is really the... Um, it's hard to say that we only open things up to these more skilled SMEs, these, these actual writers, without saying what are you doing for all the other people, uh, whether they're um, SMEs, managers, kind of legal departments, or whoever, um, who still need to interact with this content in terms of just uh, feeding back and improving. And of course, the reason they need to do this, m many different reasons, um, could be safety. I think the vast majority of our customers have some legal and financial responsibility attached to what they're attached to their content in Tridian Docs. Um, and then I think everybody these days is interested also in consistent user experience, brand credibility, sometimes tone of voice and all of this kind of thing. That, that's, of course, why we have to review content and get it right. And in terms of reviewing requirements, um, it's certainly larger groups of non-writer reviewers. It could be anybody, as I say. It could be all sorts of management groups. Um, it could be legal or whoever it is. So it's not, not even just the people that you're trusting to do the writing. Um, but way beyond that. Um, and moreover, you can't kind of control them and say, you know, you in legal, can you review it first? And when you're finished, pass it on to somebody else. You can't guarantee these kind of linear workflows because everybody has to have their input and you need to get the thing out the door. Um, so many people will be feeding back at the same time. And the way that's traditionally worked, of course, is that um, you've got this nice controlled kind of workflow. You're doing everything in Tridium Docs in a centralized way. And then you generate a Word or a PDF document, and you send it out to multiple reviewers. And then you get all of these different copies back. So that's when the whole thing becomes very fragmented. It's very difficult, um, not only in terms of the author's work, but in terms of auditability, to say if you have a certain legal responsibility to act on all of the feedback that's coming uh, back, 
then how do you keep track of all these comments and all these different copies of Word documents or whatever? Um, and it's not only about commenting, of course, it's about proposing changes to content and giving reasons for those changes. And often those reasons are attached to an external system. In manufacturing, it could be an engineering change management system. Um, in accounting or finance or pharma, it's, it's other different systems. But often we have to document you know, why we're doing them, uh, what we're doing and why we're doing it. Um, so it's really this whole question of visibility, of being able to see what was changed, when it was changed, why and by whom. And nobody has really solved this just yet. Um, both ourselves and you know other people in the in the market have certainly made attempts at this. But the whole kind of scalability and usability thing has always been a challenge. But we we th we think we're solving it now. So this is the Trillion Docs review space that we're talking about. And you'll notice this banner. This is for Q4 release. So this isn't in Trillion Doc 14, which is the July release. This is also inconsistent. You Um, and so it's precisely for keeping track of reviews and approvals. Very, very scalable again. Um, same kind of sm smooth scrolling through the whole publication. Um, takes away, of course, the ability to work with data elements and so on at that level. It's supposed to be um, comprehensible by somebody who has not the faintest idea about uh, structure or even um, authoring, to be honest. Uh, it's a minimal training. Um, but very tight integration with that draft space that Chip's just shown. Um, so what you have on the side of the draft space um, is a pane. Uh, it's a tab, basically, um, which allows you to interact with the comments and feedback from reviewers, add your own, um, reply, resolve things, and so on. Uh, so a very good integration, and I'll show a little bit of that in a minute. And then all of these comments and feedback, they need to be stored somewhere. And so we're storing them in Trillion Docs itself, in, in the CM. All of this is based directly on the, on the CM. It's not some other kind of repository. There's no caching, no syncing going on. It's all directly from the CM. Um, and so we've got this storage for the comments and annotations and a full API to be able to get them out, a report on them, et cetera, et cetera. So very much mock-ups here, but just wanted to give people an idea of, of how it's going to look and feel. So the idea, first of all, Chip mentioned deep linking. So you can uh, paste the link and send it to an author to open up. And by the same token, token uh, you can send a link to a reviewer uh, to open up a publication at any point they want. Um, say you want them to review Chapter 7, they get a deep link to open at Chapter 7, and that's where they start. Um, very easy, you just select some text and you can comment or you can propose a change. And you get this interactive view of those comments and their resolutions, their replies, their statuses, all of this kind of stuff. Um, and I say interactive, that's of course because you have various different reviewers, various different authors all interacting in here. We're not, in, we're not aiming for pure real time, um, but you know, uh, certainly within a session, there'll be several refreshes, and you will see this updating so that you can be uh, be able to keep keep track of what's going on. And so authors themselves, as I said, they can resolve, they can reply to, they can even originate comments themselves. And we're hearing of use cases where the whole of somebody's drafting kind of process would actually involve some back and forth between different authors in different locations, and this is a great place for them to do it. So you might actually have no external reviewers involved at this point, but they're purely using the commenting to, to the authors are using the com commenting to collaborate between themselves. Comments clearly, I mean, we're going to get lots of comments that be filterable. Um, by default, you'll see all the unresolved ones, but you can filter by who made them, what, what types they are, and so on. Are they technical, editorial, whatever kind of types that you define? And this is a nice feature because, of course, uh, with a view to auditability and keeping track of feedback and not losing it, uh, what happens if you've got a comment on a piece of text that later gets deleted? Um, well, you can't just lose the comments itself, um, particularly if it's from your legal department. So we have a nice way to handle that, actually. You get this little icon, which indicates we've, um, the, the original position is no longer there, but there's a, a comment that applies to this topic. 
um, and then you'll get a link which will say something like new original version. Um, and it actually takes a snapshot of the previous revision of this topic itself so that you can always go back to that and see the comment in the original context. So you kind of get the benefit of uh, both the, the word style reviews where it's constantly like the, the live view of uh, the current status of the document and the kind of the PDF where it's always how was it originally when it was sent out. So you kind of get the best of, of both worlds there. And very quickly, other features coming up with the review space. Um, so replies, as I mentioned, uh, types of comments, technical editorial, or whatever you would like to say. Um, types of resolutions as well. Do you say this thing is accepted, partially accepted, dependent on something? You can specify all those types centrally and, and have your teams use them. Um, the same kind of granular approvals that we have now in the other tools, um, so making that available to reviewers and SME authors, uh, so you can move the status of this stuff. So that you have the right to review, basically. So that's a preview of what's coming up. And of course, well, sorry, first of all, timeline, which is what I mentioned, the draft space in July, Q4 for the review space. Q120 was saying for document history, which is a detailed view of changes in documents, which is very uh, important as well. And I just quickly want to step to some kind of design principles for this, because when we say something like change tracking, that can mean all sorts of things to different people. And we all kind of tend to gravitate to the word view of change tracking, which of course works in a, in a limited kind of sense across a small group of people. But as soon as you start to scale it out, it gets very difficult to handle. So it's got to be scalable. Nevertheless, you've got to protect the source content. Um, a lot of people don't want their reviewers directly changing source content um, in case they mess it up and so on. Um, so protect that. Don't force linear workflows. So we, on our side at SEL, cannot assume that everybody's going to work in the same way. We have to allow for multiple different kinds of workflows. Um, allow feedback to, uh, throughout the whole document and then building towards full visualization. So just a very quick preview. So this is going to come out initially within the draft space, so the authoring environment, uh, the ability to view in detail all of, all of the revisions on a particular topic. Um, and later on, we'll be looking to integrate this with the review space as well. But first of all, um, from the authoring view there. And so you jump from draft space, and you're clicking see all changes or something, and then you go into your detailed view of the changes on a on a particular topic. And it can get pretty sophisticated down to changes on attributes and all of this kind of stuff if you want. Um, it is a read-only view here, uh, but if you go to any change and you see all the changes are identified by who made them and exactly when, uh, which is great for understanding what's going on. Um, and we're planning to also make it filterable to go at any and you can always go back to that. The changes in a particular version. Um, and then if you want to jump back into the document to change further, then on any of these changes, there'll be an edit button, and, and you can jump in and edit from there. So that's what we have planned in total for the uh, SME space. And of course, more thinking next year to take this further still. And I wanted to look now at a few more upcoming themes. So we spent a lot of time talking about SMEs, what's happening in terms of the rest of the suite. So one big thing that we are seeing an increase in already um, is the demand for what we are calling, for want of a better word, knowledge portals. Um, so I'm sure you know a lot of us have been in structured content for quite a while, and we've always been evangelizing. Um, I'm sure many people have to, to say, you know, why are you still publishing to PDF? Um, everybody wants content online, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But I think. Sometimes our view of what the content was in the past was, was somewhat limited. It tended to be for a particular audience, um, just one content set. Um, it had a certain limited scope. And so when you say you get a web version of what you might have in a few PDFs, it was challenging to get people off PDFs and into that. But what we're seeing more and more is that people want something, something bigger than that, I would say. It's a capability to really aggregate uh, different types of content. So structured content is always at the core, um, but they might have kind of repositories of PDFs. 
They might have marketing content that they want to surface as well, or content written in a what you might say in a, in a marketing style workflow, let's say. It doesn't have to be pure markoms, uh, technical data, and all sorts of things. So we're seeing this case for knowledge portals. Um, and what do people do when they want to do this? So typically, um, with structured content, you either have to build your own integration to, say, publish to a, a web, web CMS or whatever it is, an intranet. And that's a pain. And I know because I've done it a couple of times myself in the past. Um, and it's always the details that catch you out. It's kind of like, okay, now I can publish a new version. How do I selectively update it? How do I delete things? It's all of these kind of challenges. Um, so you have that. You either build your own. Um, certainly some prepackaged kind of neat little out-of-box delivery solutions. And they're good as far as they go, but they tend to have limited configurability and options for kind of um, looking at other content. And both of those really have what you might call scalability and security challenges as well, particularly at the enterprise level, uh, where the requirements are much bigger in terms of performance, scalability, and, and of course, security, which is a huge topic these days. And so now, of course, let's see if my build works here so I can get the next bullets. Yeah. So Tridium DX um, already brings that enterprise content management and the scalability and the security. Um, and what I'm showing here um, is kind of a, a thorough demo that we have available. So it's our own content here, because um, we can show some customer content. But it's showing, for example, at the top we've got some Mark Marcom's uh, content. In the middle we've got some technical data. We've got some links to related articles. And then we've got some links from a, a PDF repository. But these days we've got some big, particularly financial customers um, who are building out these knowledge portals. And, and Chip, I was wondering if you could just talk a little bit about how that's working. Sure, Joe. We're, we're really seeing that this whole convergence of content, uh, for many of long-time customers, we've talked about convergence of content types. So structured content coming from uh, Tridian Docs or systems along with web-based content. And, and these really knowledge portals are informative places that we're finding this is working quite well. There's other technologies also that have become available around Tridi and DX around contextualization, which is really important. Many of you have, many of you have told us that there's just too much information and on how, that there's, how can we best even more sophisticated than traditional content from uh, conditional content. And finally, we're also looking at the ability to mash up these contents via taxonomy. Uh, we're very excited that Joe and I are that many of you have invested in external taxonomies. And being able to align those taxonomies across different systems really does make Tridi and DX work quite well. Uh, it's exciting. We have several customers who are now into deployments and into deployments. These systems more and more other uh, recordings that we can make available, Kate, uh, for folks that want to learn more about Tridi and DX. Thanks, Chip. That sounds great. And I did want to point out that what we have, uh, the capability we have right now in terms of content mashups between, um, you know, uh, Tridian sites and Tridian docs, is already based on a best practice kind of taxonomy. Um, integration in that you don't have hard links between, um, you know, say certain bits of Marcoms and, and uh, docs content. Um, it's all managed by the taxonomy. So that if you don't have content there, there won't be any broken links. If you have more content available, that can also um, show up automatically. Uh, so really a best practice kind of thing. And uh, this is actually, I, w I will say this is market leading. Nobody else is doing it exactly like that. Um, but I did want to look a little bit into the future here, um, in that what we have already is very configurable, very scalable. Um, but we want to give people a richer kind of out-of-the-box toolkit. So not to lock people into some kind of pre-programmed uh, portal thing, but just to say you have more features available right out of the box here to do um, less, less thinking around that yourself. So things um, like showing up external content, so improvements to that. Um, sharing and bookmarking content, either for your own purpose or to share with other people. And then taxonomy applications, so taking this a bit further. Um, and I won't talk about all the things that uh, we're planning around taxonomy. I, I've done so previously and will do again, but not so much today. 
uh, but I just wanted to quickly look at that in, related, um, in relationship to knowledge portals. So clearly it's all about searchability and findability. Um, that's, that's a large part of the use case around taxonomy. Things like faceted search, clearly. A lot of people will be familiar with that from shopping sites and so on. Very much applies to, uh, to knowledge portals as well, the, the ability to quickly drill down on the exact piece of content that you need based on its characteristics. So we've got some uh, content, et cetera. Equally, taxonomy can be used for synonym search, um, so searching for something under various names. Taxonomy is a great way to do that. Not that there aren't other ways, but they tend to be unscalable. Um, so given that you have this centralized kind of terminology in taxonomy, good to use it for synonym search too. And then content suggestions. Um, so people often drop into a certain page on a knowledge portal um, from a search. And it could be an internal search, could be an external search if it's public content. Um, and it's, uh, that single page is often not enough to, to enable them to make the decision. It could be they are looking for a quick answer, in which case one page might be enough. But often it's kind of a more nuanced decision they need to make, something like, what must I consider before I follow this procedure? Or what other content types might be useful to understand the, the reference content on this page, like videos and KB articles and so on. Um, so again, taxonomy can. Um, can enable you to automatically show related links without having to kind of hard code them into your content again. So just a quick look at the future of uh, content delivery there. Also wanted to talk briefly to architectural improvements, which I think is um, a subject of interest to, to quite a few people on this call, actually. Mm -hmm. So first of all, in terms of translation connectivity and context, always very important, of course, to SDL. Um, got lots of thoughts, but two particular highlights. Um, what you've seen in terms of review space, we plan to make that available as a, as a basic kind of in-country review capability as well. So when you've translated a publication, uh, you have the ability to at least make comments and resolve comments on that. Um, so that could uh, certainly replace like a PDF workflow around in-country review. Now, clearly, we don't want people editing uh, translated content directly uh, in the CMS, so uh, we wouldn't look to get this into draft space, but certainly in terms of review space, the idea that you can review, review multiple languages, if you like, if you choose to make that available. Language cloud support as well, and uh, hopefully people have had a chance to learn about uh, SDL's language cloud capabilities and the roadmap for that. Very exciting, and of course, uh, we'll be integrating with that. Um, then a lot of people are interested in kind of more cloud-friendly or IT-friendly architecture and configuration. Um, and uh, upgrades are always, uh, you know, always something to consider carefully. Is it going to affect the way that you're working with your content now and, and all of your processes? Um, we have made steps, and I talked a little bit about ish deploy before. We've made steps to uh, improve and centralize this, and we very much plan to continue with that to make upgrades as automatable as, as possible. And going with that as well, we want to gradually shift to more microservices um, architecturally, which is not something that you know, end users will directly see the benefits of, but it's, it's things like easier upgrades, easier maintenance, easier problems to that. I won't go too much into this, but, but basically looking at revamping the architecture of the web clients, which, which really needs a bit of a, an update here. So removing the older kind of harder to maintain code, based it on a more modern architecture, uh, which frees us up to improve the UX and, and work on new features for it faster. Um, and both of these big bullets uh, are also what you might call the path towards containerization for people who have asked about containers uh, previously. So these are necessary precursors to a use case. They're also precursors to containerization, so that's something also on the radar there. There's something else which I haven't put in text here, um, but it's something we're looking at, which is, of course, constantly people are interested in, in reporting and metrics and saying, well, is this, uh, we know this is kind of working for us, but, but how much is it working? How much can we justify like, uh, the savings we're making through reuse and so on? Um, so we've had various in interesting discussions over the years. Uh, Frank Plossett did a good proof of concept last year on a framework around reporting. 
And we want to do a bit more, but uh, starting from that framework, um, look to do a bit more of an elaborate proof of concept at Connect this year on content reuse reporting. Um, and looking to get basically a bit more of a toolkit around that, um, so have more supporting to start. Um, so, so watch this space, I would say, for that. OK, so I hope people like what they've seen so far. And so what are the next steps to find out more? So for information on the general kind of product vision and the CS features, uh, we have some attachments and links. Um, and as I mentioned, the slide deck will also be available, I think, from, well, sometime in the next couple of days. Um, for good technical details on Tridium Docs 14 itself, look out on docs.stl.com after mid-July when it's technically available. Um, I know you may experience a thinking feeling if I'm telling you to refer to the docs, but we, we spend a fair bit of time you know, really making the documentation nice and usable on things like draft space and so on, um, so you can get a lot of uh, good information there, I'd say. Um, and then, of course, plan for migration or ask any other question. I think that a good first point of call would be uh, to contact your account manager. So hope you like what you've heard and looking forward to uh, questions and answers. Joe, Joe, this is Chip. I wanted to add on the docs at stl.com when it's available, STL, we have extensive release notes on what's fixed, what's new uh, for all the products. So we get a lot of questions around that. And uh, we've seen preview copies, but that will be out in uh, mid-July for people to read. Thank you, Chip. Yeah. Great. Thanks, Joe and Chip, for presenting today. We're now going to open up to Q&A. So if you ha do have any questions, please pop it into the, um, into the que ask a question box. Uh, OK, we've already got a couple of questions come in, so we'll start with those ones. Um, first one is, is there automated email integration for comments? Meaning, does it let the comment commenter know that there is a response to their comments? It's kind of on the radar. I would say. Um, in terms of priorities, um, it's kind of medium, I would say. Basically, we have in view an, an enabler to be able to do those kinds of things. Um, and it's certainly very feasible. And I just have to look at exactly when, uh, when that could fit in. But it's certainly on the radar and, and makes sense, I would say. Joe, one thing that's nice about commenting is the ability to filter on metadata, correct? Maybe you could talk a bit about the filtering on metadata. If you're not getting notified, but at least you could go and, and filter by metadata? Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, so I talked about the annotation types. So I think out of the box, we're going to do something like technical, editorial, general. Um, but you might have all sorts of different types of comments that you want to um, classify for reporting purposes. But that will equally allow you to filter. Um, and let's see, it's challenging me now, but off the top of my head, what else is relevant? I think we agree that by person, of course, you know, the poster is also relevant. Um, by default, I said we'll show uh, unresolved, but you can also look at resolved comments. And we'll look at other, um, other types of filtering that might be important. So it'd be good to hear people's thoughts on that as well. well what else might be and relevant for filtering? And Joe, and then being able to navigate through those filtered results will be really nice. So I think we'll, we'll see as we get later in the year when we do another webinar, we can show some of the ideas that are in development right now. Yeah, sounds great. Yeah. Next question, can multiple authors edit one document at the same time? Um, so document in the sense of publication, very much so, yeah. So we're not doing something like locking a publication, which I did hear of somebody doing with a, um, well, anyway, we're not, we're not locking the publication. Um, so essentially, if you're on different topics in the same publication, that's absolutely fine. We're still respecting that this whole thing is built on core Tridian Docs conventions of you know, checking out topics of revisions of versions and all of this kind of stuff, um, which means it's also predictable in the way that you can understand it and set it up and maintain this and so on. Um, so if somebody has a topic checked out, which is not a big deal, to check out a topic, you click in the topic. And if you've got permissions to be editing, um, you, you start to make changes, and it will check it out to you. 
and it's one click to basically check it back in again. Um, but if somebody has it checked out, somebody else can't edit it directly at that time, because we want to keep track of who's, who's changed what at what time. Um, but certainly in terms of different topics in a publication, that's absolutely fine, and that's what we anticipate. Okay, the next question, is the content in Porter rules-based? How much work does it take to set things up to get a decent import result? This was a good question, yeah, um, from near the beginning. I just, I, um, I wanted to make something clear. Um, I'm not sure if, this isn't a converter in the sense of like a universal converter from DocX to Ditter or something like that. Um, if that's the kind of transformation you want to do, there are various bits of open source kit around to help you do so. Um, plus, there are you know there are organisations that will help you do that. Um, so if it's getting into into DISA in the first place, we aren't uh, attempting that one. But this is very much about getting from um, any kind of DISA uh, into Tridian Docs with all the metadata that you want on mass, um, and also um, obviously controllable remotely as well. Um, and I mentioned DocX in the sense of um, that you can attach binaries into Tridian Docs, basically. So that, so that was the sense. If you import a Word doc, it goes in as a Word doc. Um, but in terms of rules base, I mean, if you want it to be importing something from a certain folder at a certain point in time, nightly, whatever it is, then that's all the kind of stuff that you can do because of the command line interface. Hope that helps. Great, thank you. I think we've got a couple more questions coming. Next one is, how long will support be available for collaborative review? Can existing collaborative review licenses been transferred to for use in draft space or review space? I think that's, that's a good question uh, to follow up with account managers, I would say. Um, it's, uh, you know, it's a, it's a lengthier answer than we have time for now, but certainly follow up with our account managers to talk about your your situation and what you would like to do in, the, in that case. Okay, and the next question, I think this one's for Chip. Um, if our Tridian Docs 14 is an, is an on-prem implementation, how does DraftSpace integrate with it? Is DraftSpace a cloud-only option, or is it also deployable as an on-prem inside the firewall application? Oh no, it's absolutely so good. Good question. Well. So the good yeah. the good news is is that draft space and review space are designed to interact directly with the content manager server, and so that makes uh, draft space review space available for both on premise or cloud based SDL solutions. They're identical. So our SDL made a, a investment to have uh, draft space review space go directly into the content manager server on Tridian Docs 14 and later. And so this is an important architectural and scalability uh, uh, benefit that we're going to get. Uh, many of the technical folks in the audience know that you can have multiple content manager servers to scale up to support larger uh, groups of users. Also, it's worth noting just space review space are counted as what we call concurrent uh, users or floating licenses. So it gives you flexibility. We understand that your SMEs may be part-time and reviewers may be part-time. Um, but everyone interacts directly with the content manager server, so it's available both for cloud and on-premise. Thank you, Chip. Yeah, no, absolutely right. And uh, um, I'm constantly, you know, having uh, People have known me for a while now that I was in consulting and, and worked with various systems um, for a while previously. Um, and I constantly kept coming back mentally to the fact that uh, Tridian Docs just had this very future-looking design around the data models, around the whole CM and everything. And I'm constantly grateful for that as, as we build out this draft space and review space to say the really intelligent ways of handling content that we can rely on that are coming from core CM capabilities there. So yeah, all very much built on what you're familiar with in terms of the, the CM, the, the metadata, the workflow, um, and of course architecturally as well as coming from the CM. So Joe, that's the end of the questions. Um, many folks asked earlier for the link to the draft space demo, so we put that inside the um, audience uh, uh, announcements. 
Kate will also add it into the attachments and links if you want to see that. Again, on SDL, uh, the community.sdl.com is where that's located. So, Kate, I think we're about wrapped up for today. Great. Thank you.